our culture will be threatened if we don't have ice, you know, it, it's all based around ice. We're taught to watch the ice, watch the current, wind direction, and everything evolves around the ice. I can't imagine living in a place without ice, and I can't imagine myself living anywhere else. Their lifestyle is changing dramatically, and they have to adapt to it. You know, we can go to the grocery store, but most of them are going to the ocean. The ice is retreating pretty fast, even beyond the modeling, and things are warming. And what we also see is that it's not just the atmosphere that's driving the warming of the seawater, that the ocean has gotten warm and it has a lot of heat capacity. So that water is moving northward in this region, so it's helping to melt the ice too. There's a seal directly in front of us, about 600 meters. We're gonna have Sean and Mike go directly towards it. I want you guys to go to the left-hand side and we're gonna to go to the right. It's on a flat pan of ice. It's probably already seen us, so be ready. The overarching project that we're dealing with here is to look at how climate change is altering the food chains up here in the Bering Sea. Right, or if it's the one behind that one. You actually wanna go back, I think. You've got, you kinda know how far around you wanna go. Um, I can see the ice is right up to your right. The Bering Sea is one of the most productive oceans in the world, and it is the largest U.S. fisheries. The Bering Sea is located at the point off of Alaska where Russia and the United States almost touch. This is a great place to study food webs because it's, it's a shallow oceanographic system. Afghan Bridge, you have permission to commence the beam trawl. All the food for this system is produced by single-celled algae in the water column called phytoplankton. And usually there is a very uh, concentrated period where there is lots of growth of this material in the spring, and it's called the spring bloom. And by spring bloom, what I mean is that the algae just begin to proliferate like crazy. And that's the beginning of the whole food web. French deck, zoop net is in the water. Roger. These organisms that are being collected are the things that are feeding the first feeders on the, on the primary production. So this is the first step of the food web that goes into the fish or goes to the bottom, feeds the animals on the bottom that the whales, the walrus, all the other organisms feed on. So this is a pretty important part of the whole food web. There are some little zooplankton guys in here like larvae from crabs and things like that. And some of them you can tell have been eating this phytoplankton because they are their bodies are just filled up with phytoplankton on the inside. And this little guy, is, he's not in there alone. You only see him because he's at the surface, but down deep there's all their amphipods, which are like small shrimp, there's, there's worms in there, and they make it a neighborhood. And so what we first want to determine, what are the different neighborhoods, and then what's, that, what's the physics and environmental parameters that influence that, and then how is the neighborhood changing? Who's coming in, who's going out? and is it being driven by changes in current, and mostly up here it's changes by food supply. Primarily what I'm interested in is understanding how multiple human threats are affecting ecosystems. Because these, these animals and plants are not being hit by a single item, they're being bombarded by increasing ultraviolet radiation, global warming, uh, pollutants, loss of habitat, all these things are happening to them simultaneously. And so to extract a single factor that's causing these things, or to look at how those many, many factors interact is, is A, very difficult, but B, incredibly important. I understand that there were a couple more seals up the bow. Can you still see them? Over. Since that time, we know that there's been an awful lot of changes in the environment, potentially due to global warming. We know that there's been a reduction in the amount of sea ice. A lot of these seals are strongly associated with sea ice, and we expect that a reduction in the amount of available habitat 
the reduction in the amount of available sea ice uh, may have affected their populations and that's one reason why we're out here performing these surveys. I think we're going to have to come at it from three different angles if we're going to have any hope at all. I think people are recognizing that we've got big challenges ahead and it's time to face them in terms of, of climate change and the Arctic's giving us a lot of signals that things are on the move and we need to respond. Once a system like this has changed, it'll t it won't necessarily come back the way it was. If you wait till the end to when it's really catastrophic, then it's too late.